Well, hey there. Welcome into another episode of The Winsome Creationist, joined again by my friend, Dr. Phil Dennis. Phil, how are you doing, sir? I'm doing great, Steve. Good to be here. Yes, sir. We are um, j- diving into the second episode in our series, talking about the Anisotropic Synchrony Convention, um, talking about today the creation time coordinates that we've covered before here on this channel. And I'm just really excited. This has been a, a great series. We're getting some good questions and engagement so far. In fact, let me just say a word about that. If you have questions, post them as comments on these videos, and we're going to be kind of um, getting those together and doing a couple, you know, at least one, but maybe more episodes sort of responding to some of the questions and challenges that you might have on these things. So if you're curious about that, have questions or anything, please leave them in the comments. Okay. So last time I was with Dr. Dennis, um, we talked about the anisotropic synchrony convention and sort of the way that we set that up is I, I thought it was a, interesting model, but it seemed a little arbitrary to me. And so I had Dr. Tico Tenev on last year, and we covered his CTC or creation time coordinates model. And this model, I was hoping, would be able to sort of give some teeth to the anisotropic synchrony convention. And if you want, you can go back and watch that whole video. It's here on the channel. And the, the thing is, is I still had some questions about that. I'm not really sure how it all works out. Some of the things that, that me and Dr. Tenev had talked about were just a little confusing. And so we wanted to address that, me and Dr. Dennis here on the channel as well. And, and sort of, this is, this is sort of Phil, you know, walking me through my, my own challenges and helping me to sort of understand what's going on in the, in the wider context here. So the way we decided to do this, and this is just pure collegiate scientific engagement. We're not, we're going to do our best. No ad hominem attacks here. We're not attacking Jason Lyle at any point. We're not attacking Tico at any point. I had great conversation with Tico when we talked, but we want to use some clips from that previous conversation to sort of set up some of the questions and things that we, um, you know, that we're, we're aiming to answer and get clarity around. And hopefully you will find this instructive and helpful in that regard. Phil, any questions for me before we dive on in? None that I can think of. So All right. let's, let's proceed. Yes. All right. We're going to queue up the first video here. This is, I think, about two minutes long, something like that. Oh, well, is the existing universe old or is it perhaps not as big as we think it is? Let me just tell you right away, the universe is bigger than 6,000 light years in diameter. It would be really tight to fit all the masses of the planets and everything. And I, and our observations are really good. So one thing actually that I would like to propose here, and, and I know maybe a lot of people would, would take issue with it, but I believe our science is actually very good in terms of what it observes and the data that it get, gathers. Where it begins to become questionable is how you make conclusions from that data. And that's really what we were going to discuss here. And then we'll try to, I'll try to point out to the one principle that really is at the core of that creates a lot of problems that is actually not founded on science. It's founded on pure faith and it's actually wrong. But the observations that we get from astronomy, from um, the things you can get in the lab, those are actually really reliable and uh, it, it will be very difficult to in fact, it will not be prudent to come up with theories that contradict them and try to somehow explain that they're wrong when we can confirm it. So we can, I think we can be fairly sure that distant stars are very far. And we can also be very sure that the, the light has a limited speed. And again, some people have tried to suggest that light was moving faster in the past, but that has some problems as well. And I can get into that, but that's, this is in a nutshell, the, there is a paradox. And I want to actually call it a paradox, not a problem. It's a paradox. It appears yeah. to be a problem, but actually it's not a problem. And the reason why it appears to be a problem is because we think we know something about special relativity and therefore we come up with this contradiction, apparent contradiction. But if you actually learn more about special relativity, the contradiction goes away. So it only go, it's only if you know it halfway or if you understand it halfway and if you apply it halfway. But in the end of the day, it turns out to be a paradox and not an actual problem. All right. So, um, so I'm going to bring your slides in here, Dr. Dennis. I'm not sure if this is kind of where you want to start, but so it's a paradox. It's not a problem. And, um, we have, 
you know, Tico wants to sort of affirm that we have the that the the sort of secular distances, the models that are being used currently by mainstream scientists are accurate. So what do you have to say about that? Well, that's that's a fundamental tension to claim that the distances are what the secular say they are on one hand and then say that the speed, there is a definite speed of light that's saying that's a paradox doesn't resolve the issue. I mean, what we have to actually do is look at the mathematics and the physical structure of the model. The way the paper was written in introduced CTC, we get into the issue of eternalism and uh, presentism essentially right off the bat. Now, Tico it says that he is a presentist. So I'm going to analyze his model within that presentist paradigm. Okay. And then see if we have outright paradox or outright contradictions within the model. The issue from the paper is when you talk about creation time coordinates, it gives the impression that what you're doing is you're selecting a label and applying a coordinate just to the creation event. And that's what God used to label the, the creation events. Now, I don't have a severe objection to that other than the fact that it's not a mere convention or labeling that God pronounced the first day to be the first day. It was the first day, right? And there was a, there was a 3D spatial universe on the first day. And then the question is, how big was that universe on the first day? And so on and so forth. So that that's the presentist point of view that God created a 3D universe. And then it has a certain size. And in the matter is distributed within that 3D space at various distances, say, from the Earth. And are they moving outward or are they stationary and so on and so forth? So, but the question then becomes, what is the distance to the Earth within that 3D space? Okay. And then uh, Tico said that the secularist distances are indeed that large. So that statement would imply that on, on the day that the objects were created, they were placed at that, those tremendous distances because when we look through the telescopes, for example, at James Webb, we're looking back in time, right? And, and one thing we have to say is that we're looking back, you know, 6,000 years or seven to 7,000 years. So that is the light travel time problem. In other words, if the distance to right. Jade's was 3 billion light years when the light was emitted, then the light can't get to the earth in uh, 7,000 years. So if Jade's was exactly 3 billion light years away, then, then there is an issue. The first point is, now Tenev, uh, Tico did not present a metric for his model in his paper. And uh, you should always do that if you're doing relativistic physics. You should lay down, here's what the metric is, and then use that to compute distances. I think we've touched on that briefly in the discussion. Now, Tycho's hyperbolic surface, which I call S here on the right side of the slide, is known as a pseudosphere. And I'm comparing it to a regular Euclidean sphere on the left, S. And the feature of the Euclidean sphere, S, is that S is the space that we're talking about, okay? So can you see my mouse tracking the... Yeah, yeah, we okay. can. All right. So the, the feature is that events or points on the surface S, E1, E, and E2, are all the same distance from the center of the sphere, right? And mm -hmm. any point E1 and E are equivalent to each other because you can just rotate the sphere and move E to E1 or move E to E2. That's what's known as a homogeneous uh, uh, space. No point in the uh, space is distinguishable uh, from any other point based on the, just the geometric properties of, of the space. Right? Mm -hmm. So that's what I say, all points are geometrically equivalent. So in Tycho's paper, he presented his surface labeled by a creation time coordinate. And that surface was a hyperboloid uh, presented in space time, which, you know, I, that's okay. 
it's an abstraction, mathematical abstraction. But the uh, geometric properties of this pseudosphere is that all the points on the surface S, for example, E1, E, and E2, are a space-time interval R from this temporal origin O here. Okay, so mm -hmm. again, all the points in the hyperbola are equivalent. And uh, space is measured given uh, Tycho's presentism interpretation. S distances are measured along this line. Right, they're not measured uh, out here in space-time land or whatever you want to call it. So, right, yeah. So all of these points were created at the same time. And so the distance of points, meaning measured at the same time, is along these curve. For example, the distance from E1 to E2 has to be measured along the arc from E1 to E, and then from the arc from E to E2, all right? So that's what I mentioned down here for presentism. The distance from E1 to E2 is measured along the arc E1 to E2. Okay. okay, and all these points are the same. So I'm probably getting ahead of the game. The other issue I had was that Tycho said that his model placed the Earth in a special point, but it didn't. All the points in this hyperbola are geometrically equivalent. Right. Okay, all right. Right. Yeah. So the model itself doesn't really, because, um, you know, what, and we'll talk about this later too, but what Tico seems to take issue with is the cosmological principle. But what you're kind of saying here is that, well, in actual reality, in, in actual geometric space, all points are, are, are sort of the same distance. So there's not a yeah, special from, place. From, yeah, from this O, right. So this temporal point in the future. So gotcha. we'll get into this distance what it has to be according to Tycho's interpretation of the scriptures that he believes this mm -hmm. has to be 24 hours, right? On the fourth uh, day for the light to get. Right. So um, that so, has implications. Yeah. So, well, that, I'm glad you actually, you said that. So um, I'd like to, before we move on to the next video, um, I'd like to, if we can try to make it clear for, for sort of a lay person, um, what really what the implications are of what you've just of what you've just shown and, and explained because again the problem is is that um tico believes that you know how the distances and everything shake out are, are a paradox but you think that they're not a paradox that they are actually a, a a problem is there a way to make it more clear exactly what the what the what the crux of that problem is right uh, let me maybe i should have drawn it on this slide also Having selected, as a presentist, having selected, you know, something very similar that I did in my 2018 paper also, you know, I said that the uh, mm -hmm. creation surface was also a hyperbola, although it's within general relativity, that as a presentist, you have to measure the distances along this, this arc. The secular model is taking a shortcut from E1 to E2. They're saying that's the distance. Okay. Mm -hmm. And a, a funny property, which let me see the next slide. Yeah. So what, what, what is the size of the CTC universe as opposed to the secularist distance? What, what transpires is that the secularists, of course, do not use this as the, a creation event. What they say is that if this is the earth, the distance to an event is along this horizontal line, which corresponds to their cosmic time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And a, a curiosity of Minkowski space time is that this distance D, although if we interpret this as a Euclidean distance, it looks longer than R, but it's not, it's smaller than R. And okay. that's, that's because the Minkowski metric subtracts off basically this distance from this distance and thus making this D approximately a hypotenuse smaller. So the distances along Tycho's pseudosphere are smaller than the reported secular distances. Does that help at all? Or, uh... Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think so. And, and so, but he calls that a paradox, right? So he doesn't seem to think that that's actually uh, problematic. 
Well, I, I believe it's paradoxical because he's not keeping track of the analysis or the mathematical way they compute distances in the secular secular models. Yeah. They actually mm -hmm. use the Big Bang model to uh, tell us what the distances are. I mean, among other things, I mean, they have spectral uh, and intensity and uh, things like that to estimate the distances. But even those are estimated based upon assuming a particular 3D spatial geometry, mm. right? So if you assume Euclidean yeah. or what other various cosmological uh, val parameters, values mm -hmm. are, you're going to get a different distance. For example, when the secularists say the size of the, the radius of the universe out to our limits that we've seen is 41.4 billion light years, that is the distance that they claim the size is now. Right now, according to their cosmic time of 13.8 billion years. So I've mentioned in, in other talks that, well, even that you see raises the issue with them that how is that everything traveling faster than the speed of light? Because everything moved from basically small distances to 41.4 uh, billion light years in 13.8. Well, if it was respecting the speed of light, it would only be 13.8. But the other issue then is that when they say Jade's, for example, was 41.4 billion light years away, if you actually look in the models, it was only, now this is according to their distances, 3 billion light years away, right? So according to their model, it took the light from Jade's 13.8 billion light years or so to travel 3 billion light years. Well, that's slower <laughs> than the speed of light, right? Light's going slower than the speed of light. Well. That's because the light gravitational effects are impeding the light's approach to the earth. But that, that's right. a topic for another uh, uh, session. But anyway, I, I didn't put the mathematics here, but you can compute based upon this pseudosphere model with this R being the temporal radius and R being the purported secular distances that Tycho says he believes that the actual distance D as opposed to this R is only 31 light days. Right. Now, that's a very tiny universe. So mm -hmm. you, you can't say that the distances the secularists are reporting as R that's traveling through a non-existence, that's being a distance in a non-existent space, right? Well, for my case, I, I, let's take this as day zero, right? Uh, none of this stuff down here below existed, right? So the distances right. can't be measured in a non-existent space. It has to be, if we're going to keep true to our presentism, we have to measure it along this arc. So that, that's, the, that's the main point to be made here, that if you're a presentist, you need to be consistent and uh, measure distances according to the uh, philosophical and mathematical model that you're using. Right, because... Because what's, what's ending up happening here, and I, we might actually talk about this somewhere else too, I can't remember, but I'll, I'll make the point now just in case, um, is basically, yeah, that, that, that Tico's universe, according to the model that he's laid out, is, is too small for him Correct. to accept the secular distances. That's kind of the prescient right. point, is right. that right? So I, I would label that as a contradiction between the secularist models and his models. And gotcha. my model has the same issue, right? Although I don't think mm -hmm. it's a problem. So right. I think I mentioned in other talks, my distance is, is 200,000 light years at the time of creation or 200 to 300,000 light years. And that the, everything moved away from the earth after that initial uh, creation. So, right. But yeah, but, but your, your solution to that is entirely different. Um, Tico doesn't really even have access to that solution on, on his model because he's using special relativity and, 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 you know, dealing with the expansion of space and everything. Right, the expansion of the matter. Right, he doesn't. Right, he doesn't address that directly. I mean, he he talks about it, I believe, in his paper, but there's no yeah. detailed analysis. So, okay, all right, good deal. Well, I'm gonna uh, queue up the next video here, and we'll move on. Yeah. So before I go to Jason Lyle's submission, let's talk about how fast light travels. Okay. Yeah. Light is a very interesting object. Let me just ask you this. Let's say that you have what's the nearest star to us. The sun? I would use let's it. Use the it. sun. Okay, we can use the sun. I was thinking <laughs> of another star, but sure. Let's let's use the sun. Okay, so light 
travels from the sun to earth in eight minutes, right? Something like that. That's from our reference frame. That's from the viewpoint of somebody sitting on Earth, like stationary with respect to the sun. If you are traveling with a spaceship past Earth in a very fast spaceship, you will actually see that the light reaches Earth a bit faster. Depending on which direction you're moving, it may reach a little slower, a little faster, but you will actually, the time it takes for the light to reach Earth will be different. And why is that? Because special relativity tells us that the, the, the distance between the Earth and the sun is actually not an absolute thing but it depends on the observer. It depends on whoever is moving. So if you're moving very fast, the distance is going to look like it's shrinking. Okay. So what it means is that the time for the light to reach Earth is, is relative. It's not, it's not a very good quantity to use. It, it works out for us because you know, you kind of, we like to think in terms of those quantities, but it's not a, what mathematically we call invariant quantity. So, a better quantity to use would be to actually use something called proper time, because then we can say it's objective. The proper time is basically what happens if you take a clock and you attach it to the traveler and you actually measure how long that traveler takes to reach Earth. So you heard me there with Tico. Um, I was just as confused as I am now. So I think I'm just going to let you take it away <laughs> and we'll clarify as we go along. Okay. Yeah. There's, there's a lot to unravel there. Uh, he, he says a bunch of things about, uh, the, the issue of length contraction is he said, that's what you see. It turns out that the Lorentz contraction, no one actually sees that it's, that's what is computed. That's a computed distance. The issue that if you're traveling a spaceship towards the light source or away from naturally, it's going to take different times because the event of reception, if you're traveling towards it, is not the, the event that if you were stationary, right? In other words, mm -hmm. if you're approaching it, it's going to take less time, right? And if you're receding, it's going to take longer because it's the photons chasing you. And if you're a material object, it's true that you want to use your proper time, which is the actual time registered on an ideal clock that you're carrying with you. And that's the basis of all, basis of all the physics. I, I, did he say in that clip that you have to use the proper time? For yeah. The photon, the photon has no proper time because it's, you know, it's, it's a, a null interval abstractly in space time. And, uh, the, the slide here, uh, I want to illustrate that within the mathematics of, uh, relativity, uh, if you have the space time view and you have a photon that's emitted at point P, it's traveling along this null vector in, and by null, I mean that if you compute the space time interval from P to Q, it's going to be P zero. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, but mathematically, what you can do is you can introduce a parameter Lambda that is Lambda goes from zero to one that this point along this null ray proceeds from P to Q. Okay. So there, there is a distinct way of describing photons traveling from one spatial surface at some time tau equals constant up to a, a time later. And that corresponds to a photon traveling within the 3D space of P to Q. Let me. Right. Yeah, because one of the issues was that was that I was getting confused about is that he was he was kind of saying that photons don't experience time, but they do. Yeah, that's that they travel through time, right? And uh, we measure time by using again ideal clocks. Uh, I think the, the the main point I would make at, at, at this is that. Uh, trying to make an issue of the space-time interval, which is an abstraction for a photon being zero and claiming that in some sense that the photon doesn't experience time is not staying true to the mathematics of special relativity. I mean, after all, I mean, the only one that experienced things are, are sentient beings, right? I mean, I, I know he, can, he might be just speaking figuratively or whatever, but, uh, you know, yeah. in, inanimate particles, 
I don't know if it's proper to say they ex have experiences, right? So, right. <laughs> and, and, and yeah, yeah and, the, and the other issue that comes about from this is that typically people want to take the limit as, as a traveler approaches the speed of light, but the, a material traveler can never travel at the speed of light. I mean, that's one of the very basic yeah. right, principles of special relativity, which everybody knows, they always point out in special relativity introductory text. That if you're chasing a photon, it's always receding from you at the speed of light, right? So right, yeah. It, it, as you increase your speed to the speed of light, you never get to the point where the photon slows down and is not traveling at the speed of light. So you can never make your time on your clock stop. As a matter of fact, it, it doesn't. It can only slow down relative to another observer or another material track in in the universe. It's, it's an issue of aging. Right, so clocks that are moving away from another inertial observer age slow, slowly, and if he, if they come back, then their total length of their aging will be less. I know yeah. I've just gotten into some of the you know what some people consider the twin paradox and paradoxes of uh, special relativity, but it's not really that case. I wouldn't say it's a paradox; it's just a feature of of the of the creation. So of aging, it's not an issue of time coordinates and so on and so forth. So, uh, well, let, let me talk about here about the issue of the speed of light uh, within models that are uh, commensurate to uh, Tycho's uh, special relativistic model. So he has a, a this hyperbolic surface here, say at some time T naught, and we have, and then we have a surface at time T4. So I guess we could say mm -hmm. day one, day two, day three, day four. And I'm drawing the photon being emitted from A and arriving at O at T4, right? So this is T, every point along here, according to presentism, this isn't just merely a coordinate, it's an actual time, age of the universe. Right, T1. yeah. Every point along here is at age T1, every, is T, age T2, T3, T4. And Tycho uses this correctly later on in his talk with you about how you would actually do have some time ordering. Per the discussion on the previous clip, in traveling from T0 to T1, then the photon actually traveled a distance delta s within this surface t naught with respect to this surface and that's not zero that's a space what's what he's later on in his talk with you said you know these are the causally independent space-like right intervals and it actually did take delta t according to the uh, time that we're using for the age so the speed of light is delta S divided by delta T. And that, that applies for traveling from T1 to T2. It's a different delta S divided by delta T, right? So to get from T1 to T2, it traveled this delta S. And then from T, T2 to T3, this delta S. And then finally from T3 mm -hmm. to T4. So these numbers could be different you know, delta S divided by delta T, delta T, but the global, what by that is, I mean, the total time to get from A to uh, O between time T0 to T4 is the distance here at the time it was emitted, right? DO mm -hmm. to A measure being true to presentism divided by T4 minus T0. So it has nothing to do with this abstract eternalist distance from the space time distance from a here to this point up here is zero that the space time interval is zero but that's just a statement that light travels at the speed of light that's all that is right so that that's an abstract way of saying that light travels at the speed of light i mean to put to put it very simply right yeah yeah and, and so i mean i guess the the underlying or maybe I should say overarching point here is that um, we can't we can't just say, oh, well, a photon doesn't experience time. And so right. there's yeah. no right. So, yeah. so therefore, it's zero like that right. just doesn't work. Right. Let me augment this graph. I hope, I hope this makes sense. If I draw this line down here, 
and mm -hmm. draw this line across here. Then ac according to the space time interval it, within special relativity, what you get is you get a bigger delta T, right? That gets subtract from this R here. And it turns out that that implies that the, what was called the S squared, I believe in the ASC talk is this, that T squared minus essentially R squared, and that's equal to zero for a photon, right? So doing the Minkowski geometry with this distance R and this total. T so this, see, this is a different point down here than this one here. So, mm -hmm. yeah, but so, but at any rate, you'll always get that this green line has a space-time interval of zero. And, and then Tico talks about that. Well, that causes you a problem because you're going to, you're, if, you are, if you are the photon, you have zero time. Well, for a photon, it's neither space nor time, right? It's just, a, it's, it's both zero spatial and zero time. That must be where he gets his zero divided by zero, but that's that does not comport with the mathematics of special relativity. That's mm. just a, a, I don't know, it's a notional thing. It does, just doesn't hold up with the, with the theory. So of special relativity. So I've, anyway, yeah. Anyway, this zero stuff that he's talking about is an abstraction, right? As a matter of fact, if I put the speed of light back in here, I think we talked about that. that implies that the if you solve this equation for the time and range coordinates you always get r over t equals c and that's hardly zero divided by zero right right <laughs> yeah right? just simple you know high school algebra to solve that quadratic equation right as a matter of yeah. fact it's it's plus or minus c depending upon which route you take right so i'm kind of digressing here it's actually plus or minus C, depending upon whether you're incoming or outgoing. And that's back to the issue of ASC, right? So in this Minkowski metric, the speed of light is the same incoming and outgoing. So the other previous slides, I showed an eternalist view of the photon path. And then on the previous slide, I showed how indeed there is a uh, thing that corresponds to the uh, physical, the quantity that corresponds to the physical speed of light. This is the view within presentism, that there is a 3D space sigma that the photon is moving in, and it travels a non-zero distance from P to Q within a time delta T. And so the speed of light is distance to P, P to Q divided by delta tau. Okay, so th this is the objective presentist view. I'm not addressing the question of whether operationally we can do an experiment and get into the issues of tr clock transport and a human being trying to ascertain time. <laughs> this, the, the, you know, this, this is the, cr the presentist view of what's transpiring in the model, right? Regardless mm -hmm. of whether a human is there to observe it or not, right? And, you know, the universe has objective reality, regardless of the presence of a human observer, correct? So. Correct. And yeah. the, the main thing here is that, the, interestingly, the presence view preserves the natural view of classical physics, right? Objects move through space in time. Now, the question that may come up for people that study special relativity is special relativity says there's no such thing as absolute time. Well, that's to digress back into the eternalist point of view. Right. Mm. Uh, as a presentist, you, you'll say there is an absolute time. It's just that operationally, man cannot distinguish by experiments what it is. I see. Okay. So uh, before, so kind of, it, it looks like to me, we're covering sort of the more mathematical side here of the fact that there is a physical one-way speed of light, which we touched on in our last time together Um about the ASC as well, and even looked at the Caltech camera experiments, and we talked about Doppler and all of that, that those that experimentally proved that there is a one-way speed of light. Um, is Tico introducing anything new here as a result of his model that shows, or, or where he's attempting to sh say that the CTC actually provides a solution to this that, that, you know, that somehow improves upon the ASC or not really? 
Well, what, one of the first issues is that he's, he stayed within special relativity and we're trying to uh, explain a global uh, speed of light traveling from distant galaxies to the earth. Uh, he makes the point that he's establishing an initial condition. Uh, now, I, how to take that is a little bit difficult in my mind. I mean, when God created ex nihilo on day one, uh, that's an on, that that's a reality, and he's he's alluding to that, and I give him credit for that, especially you know when when you emphasize the presentism. Now Lyle, of course, did not mention presentism at all, right? So, and right. as we talked about, he does ascribe to the eternalist point of view in his writings. So that 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 is a distinction. Okay, but yeah, yeah. The, the the he he talks. Tico unfortunately talked as if the issue was just choosing coordinates. And from my training, you learn that coordinates in and of themselves have no actual reality. They only have reality if you can explain the underlying physical basis or some operational technique on which they're based. Okay. Okay. So, uh, well, and that may actually take us to the next video, because I think that's where we're going to kind of get into his his use of the coordinates as sort of a way to um, to sort of justify that. So, OK. All right. So let's go ahead and bring that in here. It's really important to understand that because of the limited speed of, of light, we have something that we call a light cone. And it's a cone because it's actually there's extra dimension here, you measure here, it's rotated in, a, in 3D. But what this light cone represents is the future and the past of a given event. So here I have an event E, and again, this is something happened, the dog bit me at E, and then D represents some event that happened later in consequence of E, like I went to the doctor. And event C is something that happened that could have caused E to happen, like C maybe is where I petted the dog. So these three events are causally dependent. Now, in, in our normal parlance, we tend to think of this as past, present, and future. And normally we would say that's the only categorization of events. But in, in special relativity, actually there is another category of events that is neither past, nor present, nor future. And those events are causally independent events. So here is an example of event B. Event B is something happening that is outside of the light cone of event E, and that means E and B are not influencing each other in any way. Now, is B happening before E or after E? Actually, it's undetermined. So if you just look at this diagram, it looks like B is happening after E, but that's only because you happen to be an observer with this reference frame here where it looks like B is above, if you, if you plot the coordinate of B, it's going to look like it's, it's happening after E on your timeline. But actually, if you're a different observer, you may actually see B happening at a different time. Here, A is another example like that. So A, according to the, the solid line reference frame, is happening before E, but according to the, the dotted line reference frame, it's happening after E. So. This is called the uh, relativity of simultaneity. It basically just means that B and A, they are not really determinable in terms of whether they happen before or after E. We can only say that they happen independent of E. They're causally independent. So to summarize, in, in normal language, we will tend to think of past, present, and future. But when you switch to special relativity, they put like a special hat, right? When you think of special relativity then you have to think in terms of past, present, and causally independent. Okay. And the fun thing about this causally independent thing is that they can, there are a lot of them. If, if you just think of present, you will think of a single line of events. But for these causally independent things, there's so many of them. And there's, as far as special theory is concerned, all of them are causally independent. So this is going to be the key to solving the distance sterilite problem. Because what we want to show is that the creation of the stars in day four was causally independent with day four on Earth. As long as we can show that, then as long as that is possible, 
while at the same time light arrives to us in day four, as long as it's possible. And we can claim that the stars were not created before us or before day four on Earth. And our problem is solved. Partly. It's solved to a degree. Okay. So, right. So the kind of the gist of that being that if we, according to Tico, if, if we can kind of show that we have causal independence between the creation of the earth, the creation of stars, and, you know, we can basically get their light from wherever they, wherever they are, when they were created at their creation time coordinate to earth, you know, in time for essentially them to be accomplishing the goal that God wanted for them by day four, right? So that's what he kind of hopes to accomplish with the, with the time coordinates explanation. Does that sound right? Yes, yes, it does. So I have a slide here that basically sort of repeats some of the points he's making there. The point I will make is that the causal independence of events that are space-like with respect to is, does not support the argument that, that that'll solve the, the problem. Causal independence of space-like intervals does not get the light from A to C in short, short amount of time. Now he, he is referring to in, in that clip about the issue of for inertial observers traveling relative to each other, that events that are space-like in the space-like region where the two observers coincide at E, that the, whether A occurs before E or after it is are inverted, but that's just according to a mathematical construct, mm -hmm. right? Now he correctly shows later that his model preserves time order. And he correctly points that out, but that's again, that's a presentist point of view. And at this point he's describing a non uh, presentist structure of special relativity which is fine. I don't have any objection to that. But what I'd like to point out here is that just to clarify some issues, I mean, the photons themselves are causally connected, right? For example, if I'm at E and I send out a light ray, I can causally influence B, right? Cause mm -hmm. it's, it's in the, in the future of E. And, and the other point is that for any two, events in space time, you can determine by that space, the Minkowski interval, whether they're space-like, time-like, and are null or corresponding to light rays. And no amount of motion or anything can alter that, that relationship. Okay, so you, you can't alter the causal uh, future of a point by traveling at some different speed than this, this frame that's at rest. So, yeah, I'm, I'm just bewildered, I guess, is that the claim that this causal independence can in and of itself explain how you get light from a distant uh, galaxy to the Earth within the time. But maybe I need to, I, I think I alluded to that earlier. Let me go back to this slide here. This is using, again, the hyperbolic services that correspond to Tycho's time coordinates. And as I pointed out, th this is a space-like surface. So every point along this surface is independent of the Earth. Every point along this T1 is independent of the Earth. Every point along T2 is independent from the Earth. All of the points along here, right, are independent from what's happening on the earth and right. you only get a causal effect when the light arrives so it when the light cross. arrives it yeah t4. right so yeah right here yeah. at t4 at, at o, right so mm -hmm. you have cause the cause right you can't see the, i mean to state it bluntly you can't see the photon before you see it <laughs> right the zero the zero point there at the bottom let's say that's the earth right this o right here yeah yes. uh, the, the o right there yeah sorry so let's say o is, is is earth so t4 is is day four right yes, potentially yes. Uh, for the right. sake of argument on earth sure. right and, and so t3 is you know uh, again for the sake of argument day three day on earth four. yeah uh-huh and, and so 
am I right? And and maybe I'm even saying this wrong, but hopefully I'm saying it right. So on, on day three, so the light was obviously created at on the same day even let's just use that example let's just say that the stars were created right there at point a which is the same day as as Before. point o when the earth was created. well yeah right mm -hmm. well right? we're in the issue of who what day do we believe the stars were actually created but correct let, yeah let me let me renumber these because tico's diagram is t zero would be day four correct right and then this T4 would be the end of day four. Yeah. So that all the light gets to the earth within this 24 hour interval. So T0 to T4 would be 24 hours. Right. Okay. 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 So you want to go yeah. back to your question then? Or yeah. Yeah. Well, well, I guess, um, I, I guess insofar as the light is reaching the earth on day four, um, well, so that right, so that out there, so A point A is a, is at day four on on his model, and he's basically saying that the light can instantaneously arrive. At well, within twenty four hours, yes. Within twenty, yeah, on, right, within twenty four hours, correct on on day four. Right. Um, but at that point, there's a causal link, correct? Because the correct, Earth, yeah, the, yes, there's a causal link from A here at T naught and right. O at T four. And, and the photon, right, right, yeah. Right. So, so along that photon path. So, so, um, so their being causally independent seems to have nothing to do. I mean, because it, it's there is a causal influence because a person on on Earth at day four would have been able to see the light from the star. So there is causal right. influence there. Is that right. the point you're making? Yes, but the fact that at time of emission, that that point is independent of the earth at that present as time is not relevant. Right. It's just not relevant. It's, it's kind right. of a non sequitur. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so the, the crux of the matter is that, that unfortunately this explanation doesn't seem to be able to actually have the effect that, that, um, that Tico is wanting it to have. Right. Now, what my scribbling here basically would be giving the rest, the, the, spe, the non CTC special relativity time slices. Huh. Mingle, should I mingle the slide again? Right. So, <laughs> so it, it'd, be, it'd be these lines, horizontal, right? Uh huh. Right. And this point, this point, and this point are causally independent. This point and this point are causally independent. This point, so to the photon, causally independent. Yeah. From this point to this point, causally independent. Causally independent. And then finally, right, this is the arrival of the photon, right? So that's when right. you see the light. So even according to the special relativity, uh, the causal independence doesn't matter. And <laughs> rather than cluttering up this diagram again, if I drew the diagram as if this guy was traveling at some speed relative to the earth and you've got different time axes going down like this, mm -hmm. those would still be causally independent, right? And this issue of, you know, there'd be different intersections of their time. And you'd still get the same speed of light. I mean, that's that's a, that's a feature of special relativity that the speed of light is an invariant. So it doesn't matter, uh, you know, what inertial frame you're in. You're going to get the speed of light, and each each of those points are going to be causally independent. So I, I've basically shown yeah. it for both a hyperbo for a hyperbolic spatial slice here. These these and straight lines. You, you have the property that the locate the loci of the photon at various times of simultaneity are causally independent. Right. Now, I love that, that reminds me. So in the clip, he starts talking about simultaneity also. That's the other issue that the eternalists use. They say, since according to special relativity, there's no such thing as simultaneity. That means there is no now, therefore everything's happening at once. 
right. if you're following the logic, you know, non-mathematical yeah. logic of that argument. So, right. Which Tico would this, want to deny. Right. So, yeah, as a presentist, he would say there is simultaneity. It's just that we cannot uh, necessarily operationally determine what what are uh, two events are simultaneous. So, right, in, which is in, where... within the creation, that's right. So. Gotcha. Yeah, which is which is why he said they were uh, indeterminable. I think it's the language he used. Right, according to special relativity. But right. I, I'm I'm do not like to go into that simultaneity simultaneity terminology. And then say simultaneity according to the label of a coordinate. In other words, if t t prime is different than t for one of you know the two different observers, therefore everything that's equal to t for one observer and everything that's equal to t prime for the other observer implies there's no such thing as a now. That was exactly Putnam's argument for eternalism. Mm. And actually, this does kind of correspond to the diagram that Tycho had. So here I am at rest, I call it my world line. And then this, your world line, T prime, he had his, his dash, his dotted lines, right? So for me, I claim that A is in my now. And, but according to your, if you're traveling relative to me, your now, it's B that's simultaneous with you and A is still in the future. <laughs> right. right. So, so yeah. how, how can I, by motion, suddenly make an event that's real for you or me change from unreal? Mm. You find what I'm saying? That's sort of what Putnam's trying to say. He, he equivocates on the use of the word real. So right here, because he, he's saying everything that corresponds to my now, my coordinate label of T naught is real to me. And he's saying that everything that corresponds to your now, T prime equals Z is real to you. Well, that means that both since, oh, and we're both here at the same time right here at O. So I'm real to you and you're real to me. B is real to you and A is real to, to me. Therefore, A is real to me, I'm real to you and B is real to you. Therefore, A and B are real to both of us. So that's eternalism, right? That's just eternalism, yeah. right. right? Yeah. And this actually exposes the issue that why using coordinates to try to determine what simultaneity is, is the philosophical uh, problem with that interpretation of, of special relativity. These are just coordinates, T prime and, and T. According to special relativity, once the a photon emitted from A and arriving at C, you can supposedly, you can by mathematics compute the distance and when it was emitted. Okay. Mm -hmm. But you don't see, you can't see from E to A, or if you follow what I'm saying. You cannot see yeah. from E to A. Why is that? We've, we've already pointed out E and A are causally independent. So if they're causally independent, you can't see A. All you see is the arrival of the photon at C. And at that right. point, you can reconstruct this Minkowski space-time geometry by computing coordinates. And, and that's the, hopefully this makes the point. It's a, it's a mathematical computation. Right. It's not something you observe. What it's we observe, observe. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. No, I was just, I was mimicking that point. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm tracking. Okay. Right. So we only, I think I've mentioned this in other talks. We, we only see, you know, and I mentioned today, you only see the photon when you see it. Right. Right. You, you know, you know, and which gets right. back to this issue of uh, Lorentz contractions. Everybody says you can see the, the rod, the ruler contract. No, you can't see the ruler contract because that Lorentz distance is, is just a computation. Right. It's, it's a computer. The Lorentz contraction is a computation. Uh, it turns out yeah. that you, approaching rods appear, I'm probably going to say this backwards. I, I believe it's the ones that look longer and the ones that are receding look shorter. So that's because you're always seeing, if they're approaching you, you see the trailing in, and Tico alluded to this, the, amount, the time for the photon light to arrive depends upon the motion of either the source or the observer. 
if I have a ruler approaching me, I'm seeing the trailing end of the ruler further in the past when it was further away from me. Right. And I see the leading edge yeah. when, the, right. So it looks longer. And then likewise, when it's receding, it's probably clear if I could draw a diagram that, right. You're seeing the trailing in later than the, the leading, leading edge when it's receding. So that's what yeah. you see. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody needs to do, do solution of photon pass when they're doing relativistic physics rather than just using Lorentz uh, Minkowski space coordinates. So, which I've alluded right. to, you got to be really careful when you're using yeah. coordinates, you have to interpret the coordinates according to the geometric model of the space. Right. Cause otherwise you're not dealing with reality. You're just dealing with the mathematical abstraction. Right. Exactly. Well, you're, you're making a mistake by just giving coordinates re real meaning, right? You know, only if you yeah. can do a mapping from the coordinates to actual observable physical events, can they have meaning. And if you right. can't, then, then they don't have any, they don't have any, they don't have any intrinsic meaning, right? You have to come up with a, uh, yeah. Okay. All, All right. right. Very good. The logical principle is basically saying that every place in the universe small is the same. Like there's no special location. The universe in a very large scale is a scale of hundred megaparsecs. It has no structure. So we can treat the universe as essentially a, an ideal gas in some sense at that large scale. And we can write a very simple equation of state and we can evolve based on that equation. And of course it simplifies the math. It's great, but it, like I said, it yields some preposterous outcomes, which don't quite square the observations and continuously need to be adjusted. And there's plenty of presentations explaining yeah. that, but I just want to focus on this premise of like, why does this work? It's because it starts with the premise that there is no creation, that there is no creator. And there is some, a little bit of basis in that because we look from earth around, we look at what we see and we say, in all directions, the stars more or less look the same, like serial density, the micro background radiation is more or less the same. Of course, there's some variation, but we say it's more or less the same. So either one of two things is the case, either the earth is in a special location, of the universe or every location in the universe is the same and then therefore everybody sees the same thing. I bet of course the Earth cannot be in a special location because that smells of creation and that's not true yeah. because we all know that God doesn't exist and so on. So therefore we pick the other option. And so that becomes the principle under a line of uh, all of the uh, of the cosmology. And that is that is also, that is based on actually a denial of creation. So any biblical creation is or any person who believes in Bible who tries to reconcile that with scripture is always starting on the wrong track because they're not reconciling silence with scripture, they're reconciling a faith in non-creation with faith of creation, which is just not going to work. So that's the sum of it. Now, in like you we will see here in this solution of the creation time coordinate solution, we actually do put Earth in kind of a special place. So we haven't changed the science, we haven't changed the theory. The only thing that we've changed is we basically repudiate the notion that everywhere is the same, that somehow Earth is not special. We, we put it in a special place. And I think it is special. The Bible treats it specially. Um, so it's fine to think of it that way. And when you... All right. So, uh, Phil, I know we talked about this a little bit at the beginning because it kind of tied into the discussion we were having. But I, I thought there were perhaps some additional things that we wanted to say um, here on this point as well. And I'll, I'll let you go into it, but I know one of the things was just a, a concern about, you know, it's not necessarily that it's just because someone's a secularist that they're going to start with the assumption that, that the earth is not a special, you know, a special place. And then there's some concerns about the actual geometry in Tico's model. So maybe we can use that as a launching off point and just go from, go from there as we begin to wrap it up. Sure. Uh, I guess the first thing, is that uh, Tico is presenting a, a view that is pretty widespread, I guess, among uh, lay, lay creationists. But we need to separate the issue of the age of the universe from being created by the, you know, the triune God. I mean, there are old earth, old universe Christians that ascribe to the general reliability of the uh, Big Bang model on large scales. Okay. I mean, it's, it's Tico's correct. It, it's not, it was one of the early models that was made and it's been refined over the years by adding more and more detail. But 
it's it's used to model the large scale gravitational features of the universe. You know, it doesn't mm-hmm. have any structures in it. There's no. He's right that it's it's basically like a continuum fluid. You know, there's no galaxies and so on and so forth. And when they had that solution, they extrapolated it back. They said, if we run the clock backwards from what we see, we get to a, a purported initial singularity. You know, today they claim it's 13.8 billion years ago, but that doesn't say that there's not a creator, right? I mean, right. The, the point the point of contention is the age, right? Do we take the observations we have now and, and extrapolate back to a, a point 13.8? A billion uh, years ago, and that's not necessary, right? I mean, the the equations of general relativity. Well, see, now he's starting to talk about general relativity, but his model is special relativity, which is, you know, that maybe that might be a nit. Some people might say, but uh, yeah. he, he, you know, and, and then he alludes to the homogeneity and the special place. But I got the slide up there, which you yeah. shared. Is that yeah? His, his presentist hyperboloids are uh, such that the Earth is not geometrically in a special place. Now, it, we need to be clear when we talk about the specialness of the Earth. I, I don't think that the geometric special location does anything. You know, what's special <laughs> right. is the is the environment, right? Our distance from the sun, the atmosphere, the magnetic field, the tilt, so all the things that we appropriately point out that the Earth's environment is, of course, designed to support life, right? In man and so on and so forth. So that's what's special, not some cosmological uh, location within the entire cosmos. So, right. Is a, yeah. And to be clear, uh, like what you know, what you're saying is that it, you, you know, it doesn't actually accomplish anything to, to place it in a special location in the cosmos. There's just not really a, you know, I mean, right. it, it, it's in a position relative to the rest of creation, but th- th- it doesn't necessarily matter where God put his finger and decided to right. start right. things up. Yeah. So I'm interpreting his statement in, in the context of his CTC model, right? I mean, he, he points to that claims that this point E here, because it's at the top of the hill is special. Well, for somebody here, everybody thinks they're at the top of the hill. Actually, there is no top of the hill, right? It's like right. mathematically, conceptually, it's nobody here can argue that I'm further from O. Oh, hang on, Phil. Uh, I don't know if you can hear me, but uh, you cut out on e, me again. You know, hang E's on further than E1 or E2, right? E, e is no further from this temporal point O than E2 or E1. Right, and all, all these points are the same geometrically. So there's no way to do an observation. So, and again, his his model is an empty model. There's no galaxies, there's no, you know, no sun, no local environment being described. It's just all abstract mathematically, I guess is the way to put it. Yeah, so yeah, the, the complaint against the Big Bang, in, in a sense is misplaced Everybody, everybody realizes it's just an approximation and that the universe is not strictly homogeneous at smaller scales. You know, there's lumps, there's cavities, there's voids, there's galaxies. The fact that we see gravitational lensing implies, you know, from the distant galaxies implies mass concentrations. You know, they have to be pretty, pretty large mass concentrations in order to bend the light to the extent that the light's being you know, deflected by the grab falling in the gravitational field. And, and that's irrespective of extrapolating back in time also. Yeah. Right. So again, it's an issue of age. It doesn't bear on the light travel time problem. So I don't know if that. All right. Uh, it's helpful. Adds. No, it's, it is. Um, yeah, it's, it's very, very helpful. So one of the things we're, we're getting ready to wrap up here. This has been certainly enlightening and very helpful. And I'm, I'm hopeful that there was something here for the layperson and also something here for the nerds. Um, I was, you know, really, we're, we're both really making an effort to 
find some helpful ground here that is helpful for everybody. And at the same time, you know, cause we know we're dealing with people's ideas. And so we want to be cordial. Right. Yeah. Right. You know, these are, these are, it's important to talk through these issues and talk about them publicly. Um, and so this is by no means a reflection on Tico or on Jason or on anybody else that, that we talk about. It's just dealing with the issues and trying to get clear. Right. So, it's analysis of the models. Correct. Analysis of the models. So speaking of that, um, one of the things, and just to kind of set up what's coming, what's coming next. So we're going to have an episode sort of responding to some questions. So I don't know if that's going to be next or later in the series, regardless, I want you to leave comments. If you're watching this on YouTube, leave comments under this video. If you have questions or clarifications, be nice about it, please be kind about it. Just ask your question. Let's keep it about the model and, and, and the questions about the science. And we'll have Phil on to answer those questions specifically. One of the things throughout this episode and the last one that we've been sort of hinting at a little bit is this idea that, uh, of course, both ASC and CTC are bathed in special relativity. That's where those models live. And one of the one of the big things that Phil um, has been you know, has talked about in his papers that he's written over the years and, and discussions with others is that in order to solve the light time travel problem, we actually need to be working inside of general relativity and not special relativity. And so that is going to be the subject of either our next video or the next one. Um, and we'll, we'll have a whole podcast episode covering why a special relativity solution doesn't really have the teeth to uh, accomplish what needs to be accomplished and why a general relativity solution will will be what's needed to get the job done. And then after that, we'll talk about Phil's specific model. So Phil, any final words on that or questions or thoughts? Well, yeah, I think the, the issue of special relativity uh, and general relativity is essential to, you know, the, it's central to the issue. Uh, Right. We need to incorporate gravitation because that's the fundamental force that's shaping the universe at large scale. Right. And it's the large scale that we're interested in, in right. terms of the tra uh, light travel time issue. So, yeah. All right. Excellent. Well, I'm looking forward to that discussion and I'm sure everyone else is as well. Phil, thank you again for your time today. It's been really insightful and we'll talk again soon. Sounds good, Steve. Uh, and thank you. It was good talking to you. See you later. Later. Okay.